This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight, a fascinating new mystery. For years, Jim Boomgarten had the oddest encounters with people he had never seen before who were positive that he was someone else. Then his friends and family began to have odd run-ins with a mysterious stranger who appeared to be Jim's exact double. Was someone impersonating Jim Boomgarden? If so, who and why? After he assassinated Abraham Lincoln, history records that John Wilkes Booth was tracked to a farm in Virginia and killed by Union troops. But history may be wrong. A few eyewitness accounts suggest that the man in the barn was not Booth, and some historians now believe that Lincoln's assassin was never brought to justice. When Alex Cooper, a devoted father and grandfather, disappeared, his family made an unsettling discovery. There was no such person as Alex Cooper. He had created a fictitious past and become a man who never was. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. April 1865, the Civil War was over. President Abraham Lincoln was dead. For nearly two weeks, 2,000 Union soldiers scoured the countryside searching for his assassin. On April the 26th at 4 a.m., a cavalry detachment surrounded a tobacco barn on Garrett Farm in Virginia. They had been told that inside was one of the most notorious criminals of the century, or of any age. John Wilkes Booth, you are surrounded. You and all with you. 26-year-old John Wilkes Booth was an actor of national fame, considered by some the handsomest man in America. He was also deeply committed to the Confederate cause. On April 14th, Booth had mortally wounded President Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington. The man who had freed the slaves and given hope to the disenfranchised was gone. Abraham Lincoln, who had preserved the Union through sheer force of will, now belonged to the ages. On April 26th, 12 days after the assassination, an informant directed Union troops to the Garrett farm. With your hands held high. The man who surrendered was not John Don't Wilkes shoot. Booth, but 21-year-old David Harold, known to be one of Booth's co-conspirators. Lieutenant Edward Doherty grew impatient. He gave the command to smoke out his quarry. The soldiers are under strict orders to take Booth alive but an overzealous sergeant named Boston Corbett took matters into his own hands. Two soldiers dragged the body from the raging inferno. The nation was avenged, or was it? There is tremendous physical evidence which proves beyond a doubt John Wilkes Booth, in reality, was not killed by the federal government officers, as they claimed. In fact, lived until January 13th, 1903, when he died in Enid, Oklahoma Territory. According to official history, John Wilkes Booth died on April 26, 1865. 
Incredibly, this fact has given rise to an unlikely controversy in historical circles. The matter of Booth's life and death has always seemed an indisputable chapter in American history. But even the Encyclopedia Britannica states that the identification of the man shot in the barn was equivocal at the time. Those who question the official account believe that in the confusion following the Civil War, critical evidence may have been mistakenly recorded or perhaps covered up. Others dismiss these series as revisionist nonsense. We will examine both sides of this fascinating controversy, which has been brewing for 125 years. In 1866, Senator Charles Sumner argued that the government reward for Booth's capture should not be paid out. He claimed that there was simply not enough evidence to verify Booth's identity. That same year, Senator Garrett Davis of Kentucky complained that he had never seen any satisfactory evidence that Booth had been killed. And in the early 1900s, John Schumacher, general counsel to the Department of the Army, wrote, The evidence put forth by the government to support the conclusion that the body was that of John Wilkes Booth was so insubstantial that it would not stand up in a court of law. Nate Orlowick and Dr. Arthur Chitty have spent years studying the Lincoln assassination. Independently, they have arrived at the same conclusion. The most persuasive evidence to me at Garrett's barn that uh, that the man in the barn was not Booth is the fact that his friend, David E. Harold, came out of the barn and the first thing he said was, the man in there is not Booth. The man inside that barn is not John Wilkes Booth. His name is Boyd. And there was a Boyd who was a wanted fugitive at this Sorry, time Booth. for killing a Captain Watkins in Maryland. Of course, Harold was not permitted to testify in his trial, as all was the case with all the defendants. None of them were permitted to testify. His statement, of course, was, was kept secret, as all the others were. So we don't really know, because Harold was not permitted to, to say anything, and of course he was hanged, so we don't know exactly who the man was. I have heard the account that Harold was pulled out of Garrett's barn and said, that's not Booth in there. I have no source for that. I don't know where the story came from. But I Historian do. James Hall refutes this incident by citing a 40-page statement made by David Harold to government investigators 36 hours after his arrest. Harold referred to Booth 10 times by name when he was discussing what went on in the barn while it was being surrounded by the soldiers. To me, that's conclusive. I, I, I can't see where they get the idea that he'd come running out and say, it's not Booth. By the time David E. Harold changed his testimony, uh, he was under such enormous uh, pressure. He was in fear of his life. He had been uh, incarcerated with a canvas bag over his head and just a little hole to be fed through. Uh, he was under terrible emotional strain and was trying to save his neck. And, and so therefore, when, when he thought that he would uh, survive by changing his story, he changed his story. According to Nate Orlowek, other eyewitnesses also refuted the government's identification of the man killed at Garrett's farm. Colonel, this man is not Booth. What's that, Lieutenant? This man is not Booth. This man has red hair, Lieutenant. Lieutenant William C. Allen worked for the United States Secret Service in 1865. And in August of 1937, his widow, Mrs. Hannah Allen, told a journalist, that her husband had told her that he saw the man at Garrett's farm who had been killed and that the man had red hair and that the government knew that that man was not Booth, but they were determined to foist this man on the, the nation as Booth. By every historical account, Booth's hair was jet black. Stephen's testimony about the red-haired man was corroborated by two other Union soldiers, Private Joseph Zischen and Quartermaster Wilson D. Kenzie. The 16th, they surrounded Garrett's barn. They burned the barn down. They shot John Wilkes Booth. Only it's not Booth. How do you know? It doesn't look like him. No one will believe me. Come back with Kenzie me. and his buddy Joseph Zischen were friends of Booth in 1862 and 63 in New Orleans. Kenzie was a quartermaster, 
and was free to go wherever he wanted, basically, you know, within the military lines. And so he went with Zischen to Garrett's farm because he had an interest in what was going to happen to Booth. In 1922, when he was 77 years old, Kenzie detailed what he saw at Garrett's farm in a sworn affidavit. As I rode up, Joe Zizgen called, Here, come here, Sergeant. This ain't John Wilkes Booth tall. The face was exposed enough so I could see the color of his hair and the side of his face. Now, from the fact that this man had sandy hair and Booth had very dark hair, I knew at once it wasn't he. His body was exposed, the lower part of it, and he had no injured leg that I could see. You men, move away from that body. You two are under direct orders to speak to no one of what you've seen here today. Do you understand me? And he said that the officers there Sergeant, told him everyone has place. to keep this secret. There'll be dire consequences for anyone who tells the truth. The military really meant business, and they were not going to risk their lives just to tell the truth. The government autopsy was performed by a physician who was acquainted with Booth. Dr. John F. May was a Washington surgeon who removed a tumor from the back of Booth's neck a few months before the assassination in 1865. His statement is now in the National Archives. Like all the other government records on the case, it was held secret for 70 years. The corpse bears no resemblance to the actor John Wilkes Booth. John Frederick May wanted to tell the truth, and he recognized that this was not Booth, but it was made pretty clear to him very early on that uh, this better be Booth. It's freckled. I do not remember Booth as being freckled. And so we have the curious uh, affidavit, which starts off saying, I'm sure this is Booth, and then goes on to say, but it doesn't look like Booth. Uh, and it goes on to say, uh, 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 I recall uh, Booth is having black hair, and this man has uh, sandy hair. I recall uh, that Booth had rather clear complexion, and this man is, is freckled. Uh, but this is certainly Booth, signed John Frederick May. In 1906, Dr. May clarified his findings in an article titled The Mark of the Scalpel. He said he believed the discrepancies he found were due to the physical deterioration of Booth while he was on the run. Dr. May also said there was a scar on the neck which corresponded to the scar left by his surgery in 1864. Now, had the government really believed that that body was Booth's, they would have taken pictures of it. They would have had many, many hundreds of people it to identify it. But the War Department didn't do that. The government knew that that man was not Booth. Eventually, Booth's body was secretly buried in the basement of the old naval prison in Washington. It seems incredible that Union authorities would have misidentified the assassin of President Lincoln. But if John Wilkes Booth was not killed at Garrett's barn in 1865, then what became of him? When we return, We'll present evidence of Booth's escape, his later years, and startling facts about the assassination conspiracy. In 1865, the government moved quickly to close the books on the Lincoln assassination. John Wilkes Booth had been hunted down and killed. The trial of Booth's co-conspirators resulted in four hangings and three life sentences. As the nation began to rebuild, the details of the conspiracy were classified as secret and hidden away. Some believe, however, that John Wilkes Booth escaped Union soldiers, that he fled south under assumed names and lived another 38 years. In 1907, an obscure attorney from Texas named Finus Bates published this book, The Escape and Suicide of John Wilkes Booth. In these pages, Bates claimed that he learned the true story of Booth from one of his clients, a man named John St. Helen of Granbury, Texas. In 1877, St. Helen felt grievously ill, and thinking he was about to die, made a startling confession to Finus Bates. 
Finest. John. Finest. My name is not John St. Helen. It's really John Wilkes Booth. Assassin of President Lincoln. If I die, tell my brother Edwin I'm dead. Well, Bates, of course, thought this guy was crazy. He had been told, as everyone else had, that Booth had been killed in 1865. So he thought he was just hallucinating. And Booth said to him, no, I really am John Wilkes Booth. And now that I've told you my secret, I want to give you the whole story. So he poured out for Bates a very long confession, detailing in great detail the kidnap conspiracy, the murder conspiracy, how he got out of Washington, how he escaped altogether. Escaped Washington, D.C. using a password. T.B. Rowe. St. Helen explained that during the Civil War, all bridges out of Washington were closed after nightfall and heavily guarded, making escape near impossible. Halt! But I must cross. I'm sorry, the bridge is closed. I have a password. Password? TB. TB Road. All right, you may pass. Corroborating Booth alias St. Helen telling Bates of this password is the dramatic letter written by Frederick A. DeMond, who was one of the guards at the Navy Yard Bridge the night of the assassination. On May 31st, 1916, DeMond sent Bates a letter. In that letter, DeMond says that at about 10 p.m. that night, a captain rode up to the bridge and said, if anyone comes up using a certain password, let him through. And that password was TB. TB Road. DeMond says that was very peculiar because never before had anyone been allowed oh. to cross the bridge using a password. Bridge out of Washington is closed after dark. I don't know what cross. happened there that night. These were just a bunch of old soldiers later on remembering it. But Sergeant Silas Cobb, who was in charge of the squad at the bridge, made a statement uh, which is in the National Archives, and he also testified at the conspiracy trial and he didn't say anything about passwords all he said was that I thought these people were proper people to go across the bridge and I let them cross I can't tell you why these old soldiers dreamed up this as a password St. Helena's narrative continued he told Bates that he joined up with co-conspirator David Harold and together they visited a doctor who set his broken leg I'm gonna have to take your boot off so I can see your leg, all right? Booth, alias St. Helen, told Bates that when he was going through the open country in Virginia, he hid in the back of a wagon. And at one point, he heard someone shout, Dar's them soldiers now. He thought they were northern soldiers. So hurriedly, he was yanked out of the back of the wagon and hustled into the woods. <laughs> When that happened, his papers and, and other personal effects fell out. St. Helen claimed that while on his way to the Garrett plantation, he sent a man back to retrieve his papers. Before the man returned, and while David Harrell was out seeking supplies, news came of approaching Union troops. Mr. Booth, Union soldiers are riding in from Bowling Green. You need to be getting out of here. How far behind you are they? About two hours. Thank you. Thank you, General. According to St. Helen, he immediately fled. Yeah. Yeah. The man sent to retrieve his papers was in the Garrett barn with David Harold when it was surrounded by Union troops on April 26th. Harold decided to surrender. It's not Booth. The other man was shot inside the barn because a dead man carried Booth's papers. He was identified as the assassin. I believe you, John. I want you to rest. All right? Several weeks later, St. Helen recovered from his illness. Bates tried to dismiss the confession as hallucinations brought on by the fever. But St. Helen later added even more details to his story. The following year, John St. Helen left Texas. 
but Finus Bates was haunted by his confession. Can you imagine a young lawyer talking to a bar owner down in Texas, a gullible young lawyer? So he just fills him full of a great big long story. And later on, Bates, that was the name of the, this young lawyer, embroidered the story nicely and wrote a book about it. But I think he just took a young lawyer and fed him a, a line. It's that easy. Certainly it wasn't Booth. Is it possible that John St. Helen was in reality John Wilkes Booth? A comparison of photographs shows a striking resemblance. On January 13, 1903, while staying at a boarding house in Enid, Oklahoma, John St. Helen committed suicide by drinking a glass of wine laced with strychnine. Bates had the body preserved. He took many pictures of the body. And eventually, he had the body mummified to preserve it for posterity, to prove once and for all that the government had fooled us all, and he was going to not allow that cover-up to stand. In 1931, six Chicago physicians examined the mummified body of John St. Helen and recorded their findings in this affidavit. They specifically noted a scarred right eyebrow, a crushed right thumb, and a broken left leg. John Wilkes Booth is known to have had all three of these unusual characteristics. Did John Wilkes Booth escape Union troops at Garrett Farm, only to kill himself 38 years later in an Oklahoma boarding house? The history books say no. John Wilkes Booth died in 1865. Four years later, his remains were returned to Maryland and buried in an unmarked grave in the family plot. Perhaps there rests the definitive answer to this unsolved mystery. Imagine that there's someone who looks exactly like you, walks the same way you do, talks the same way you do. That has been the bizarre fact of life for Jim Boomgarden of Byron, Illinois. For years, Jim has been haunted by the specter of a strange double, a man who seems to be everywhere, or at least everywhere Jim isn't. The place, Rockford, Illinois in 1984. The occasion? a company softball game. It is a typical Saturday morning, except for an eerie event about to unfold. Third baseman Rick Holder is coming up to bat. Suddenly, his brother-in-law, Jim Boomgarden, who should be 20 miles away at home, enters a game to pitch for the opposing team. Hey, Jim! Jim! Hey, Jim! You know, I would say hi to him, and say, hi, Jim, hello, Jim, and I wasn't getting no response from the guy. So I just thought, you know, after the game was over, I'd go up and I'd talk to the guy. Hey, Jim. How's Cindy and the kids? After the game, he said he went up, shook his hand, and thinking he was talking to me. And he said the guy just kind of looked at him weird, gave him a funny look, and turned around and walked away from him. Five years later, and just a few miles away, Jim Boomgarden's father, Ernie, was leaving the doctor's office when he saw his son. Jim! My dad came after this guy and was yelling at him. Jim! This guy ignored him, got into a car, which he said was very similar to mine, drove off and didn't even acknowledge him. Now we had two people who knew me very well. And they were both fooled, especially my dad who reared me. This guy fooled my dad. He has to look almost identical to me. Jim spent his childhood in a suburb of Rockford, Illinois. He knew he had been given up at birth by his mother, but he had no idea who she was. Jim loved his adopted family, and 
his life was happy and uneventful, except for one strange incident. When Jim was 11 and visiting his grandparents in Rochelle, Illinois, he was approached by a group of neighborhood Billy. boys. Billy! You talking to me? Yeah, do you want to play basketball with us? My name isn't Billy. What are you talking about? It's not Billy. My name is Jimmy. It's Billy. Look, if you don't call me by my right name, I won't play basketball with you. I couldn't understand if, why they wanted me to play basketball so much, and they wouldn't call me my, by my name, and why they were making this name up. I could not understand that. Jim filed the incident away at the back of his mind. After high school, he joined the Army and served a tour in Vietnam. In 1978, Jim married Cindy Holder. They settled near Rockford, Illinois, and had two children. Often in Rockford, people Jim didn't recognize greeted him in an unusually friendly way. How's it going, man? I haven't seen you in a long time. What's going on? Not much. Huh? I'll see you around, OK? And I've met a lot of people, and there's no way that you can remember every face you see. So I kind of brushed off as, as nothing until some people would see me in places that I, I never was or I wasn't at that time. Finally, on Christmas Day, 1991, the strange encounters culminated at a mini-mart just five blocks from Jim's house. Shirley Hurleen was behind the cash register. Uh, pump number three. I was working, and okay. this gentleman came in. I assumed it was Jim. No, not today. Fifteen even. He looked like him. He walked the same, talked the same, same mannerisms. I assumed it was Jim. Within minutes, Jim and Cindy walk in. Do you forget something? No, why? Well, you were just here a few minutes ago. Oh, first time I've been here today. And I looked over at Cindy. I said, he's kidding, right? And she said, no, this is the first time he'd been out today. And I said, well, then, my God, there was somebody that came in looked just like you. If I'd been just 15 minutes earlier, just maybe, we could have ran into each other as he was coming out and I was going in and met face to face. How awesome that would have been to see yourself. The lady who was there said she saw a man who looked exactly like Jim in there not 15 minutes ago. She said he could have been Jim's twin. Well, you know, that got me to thinking about that. Too. Three weeks later, Jim's wife, Cindy, was visiting his grandmother, Sophie. Sophie grew strangely quiet when Cindy told her about the odd case of mistaken identity at the Mini Mart. Grandma, what's wrong? Are you okay? Ernie told me something a long time ago, and I promised to keep it a secret. Jim's father, Ernie, had died a few months earlier and Cindy had no idea she was about to hear a long-held family secret. Ernie told me that when he contacted his lawyers about adopting Jimmy, he learned that Jimmy had a brother, a twin. Jim had a twin? She said that Ernie didn't like keeping it a secret, but yet he figured that, you know, if Jim had never known his brother, that he would never miss him. I was kind of hurt at Ernie because he never told us himself, you know, while he was alive. But I was very relieved that we had somebody that could confirm that there was a twin. I was excited. You know, all the speculations are now true. I am looking for a twin brother. Jim obtained a family history from the adoption agency. To his disappointment, no names were used, but the report did give one clue. His birth mother had a nephew who drowned at the age of 14. Desperate for details, Jim spent hours in the library until he found the story in a 1945 newspaper. Finally, Jim had come up with a family name, Hieronymus. Through the phone book, Jim located a woman by that name, living just 20 miles away. 
May I help you? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Boomgarden. This is my wife, Cindy. And I apologize for disturbing you, but I was wondering if you could help me. Is your last name Hieronymus? Uh, yes. I think we might be related. You don't have to tell me we're related. You look exactly like my brother Bud. Jim had found his Aunt Myrtle, his birth mother's sister, the mother of the boy who had drowned in 1945. That would have been taken sometime in the mid 40s. She was about 33 or 34 at that time. That's about the time I was born. <laughs> I tell you. For the first time, if Jim saw a photograph of his mother, Hazel, and learned that she I had died three it. years earlier. Myrtle told Jim that his mother had cut herself off from the family and that they had known nothing of his birth or his twin brothers. Did you know my father? Well, uh, there was a man Hazel was seeing. I, I think he might have been married, but I didn't really know him. Hazel never told you about me and my brother? No. She never said anything about having had twin boys. Of course, I, I knew about the little girl she had. Little girl? When? Well, let's see. It was uh, October, November, oh, 1945. I was in the hospital myself. Jim's aunt had dropped a bombshell. Not only did Jim have a twin brother, he had an older sister as well. Now the mystery's even harder now. I got two to find instead of one, but I'm bound to determine I'm going to find him one way or the other. Finally, Jim was able to visit his birth mother's family plot. Her maiden name was Hazel Georgetta de Balfour. Eventually, she married a man named Connor, also now deceased. I found out everything except my brother and my sister in finding my family. It's the only part of the web that needs to be untangled now is finding them and, and then it will be complete and I will be satisfied and relaxed. Jim Boomgarten and his brother, whose first name might be Billy, were born in the Salvation Army Hospital in Cook County, Illinois, on March 29, 1947. His brother was adopted by a family in Rochelle, Illinois. Their older sister was also born in Rockford at St. Anthony's Hospital in October or November of 1945. Next, the baffling disappearance of a 65-year-old salesman from Canada. Alex Cooper of Cranbrook, British Columbia, Canada, was an accomplished musician, a folksy down-to-earth family man who enjoyed nothing more than fishing and camping with his wife, Margaret, his five grown children, and his three grandchildren. Alex was a local businessman who worked in the cleaning industry from 1974 to 1983. Then in 1986, he took a job as a salesman and began to spend some of his time on the road. Everyone who knew him agreed. Alex Cooper was the last person you'd expect to find at the center of a mystery. Then came the morning of April 4th, 1987, when Alex's daughter Lila and her husband Pete left Cranbrook for a shopping trip. We left Cranbrook quite early that morning, about 7, 7.30. We were going to drive to another city, which was about a three-hour drive. And it was actually Pete that said, that's your dad's car. Isn't that your dad's and, car? And, uh, you know, it was, obviously, his car. Let's stop and see what he's doing. Okay. My dad and I were so close, Pete would have known that if, if we didn't stop and say hello, I was just going to sulk all day anyway. So we did. We right away turned around. and. And uh, I, I just couldn't imagine driving by without stopping and saying hello. It's just the way we were. So we just walked right by the car, didn't really pay it any attention. We walked by it, walked down the bank to the water. We just assumed that he was fishing. Yeah, that's true. down here. At the water, I was curious. When I got back to the car, I started to get a little bit 
that feeling in your stomach like, this is really unusual, past curious now. Concerned because her father had a heart condition, Lila called her mother. Margaret Cooper had not seen her husband for more than 24 hours. I felt a great deal of fear. Lila suggested that she check out the hotel, which was close, the uh, hospitals, and then if he didn't find him, that she would go to the police. Do you know where he was headed to? He was on a regular sales trip, as far as we know, um, on his way through the valley to sell some supplies. What kind of supplies does he sell? Restaurant equipment. There was no footprints or any other physical evidence that may be around the vehicle. The vehicle was locked. He had a set of clothes that were left in the vehicle, along with some fishing tackle. Nothing that we found around the vehicle would suggest that foul play was involved in this. We're going to have to take the car, too. You can see he's going to be towing it away. They have to take the car. That has to go back to our office. We've got to check it to see if there's any evidence at all. I felt very lost seeing the car go away, and I wanted to make them leave it. You have to take it. It has to go. I felt that if the car was there, he would probably come back and get into it, and we would, this would end it. But they took the car away, and, and he didn't come back. The police launched an extensive air and land search, but Alex Cooper had absolutely vanished. Perplexed and heartbroken, his family desperately searched for answers. They learned that on the day Alex disappeared, he ate lunch at a restaurant less than a mile from where his car was found. What? Alex had a very bad habit in that he carried his money in a roll in his front pocket. And if he was going to pay for anything, out came the roll. He took off what he needed, popped it back in. And and uh, that worried me a great deal afterwards. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Heading up the road this way? Yeah. I was wondering, could I catch a ride with you? I'm just going up a little ways. Sure. Climb in. Margaret Cooper feared the worst possible scenario. Someone may have robbed her husband, killed him, and dumped his body in the Canadian wilderness. Lila Cooper imagined an altogether different course of events. I was thinking about all the things that could have happened to him. I focused on the water, number one. That was my main thought, was that he had fallen into the water. I could see him maybe going down to the creek, to the water. And being a fisherman, seeing what the possibility was of maybe trying to catch something or drop a line in, and he fell in, or he had a heart attack and fell in. Police divers dragged the creek and found nothing. The media picked up the story. Newspaper and television coverage provided yet another theory. After the broadcast, we had numerous sightings. People come to our office reporting that they had seen a fellow matching a similar description as Alex Cooper for height, weight, same type of clothing. They'd seen hitchhiking in the area of the vehicle. The investigator's theory was he just left the area on his own for what reasons, we have no idea. If Alex had indeed left by his own free will, why did he leave his heart medication and credit cards at home? And why had he taken only the clothes he was wearing? It was suggested that maybe he had staged the disappearance and just ran away from us. Um, I wasn't able to accept that at all. Um, Alec wasn't the kind of man who would be capable of creating that kind of pain for his family. He was the best father anybody could ever want, and he loved us all, and he was, he was funny, and he was sincere, and he was honest. And, you know, if I'm proven wrong, like, I guess I'll have to eat my words, but I believed everything he ever told me. The Cooper family suffered through an entire year with no word from Alex. Eventually, they had to face the painful reality that he was gone forever. Margaret Cooper petitioned the Supreme Court of British Columbia to have her husband declared legally dead. Her request was granted. 
I'm calling in regards to Alex Cooper uh, birth certificate. Margaret tried to obtain Alex's birth certificate and made a chilling discovery. N no information at all. Uh, did you check? Uh, she was stunned to learn that a birth certificate was never issued in Alex's name. In fact, prior to his marriage to Margaret in 1952, there were no official records of Alex Cooper, no high school transcripts, no military papers, no medical history. As far as anyone could tell, Alex Cooper simply did not and had never existed. Finding no record of him made me feel very mixed up. Um, unsure of myself and of him because um, I guess I had to really admit for the first time that he hadn't been completely honest with me in things. Made me really wonder about his identity. Didn't make me wonder about him as a person though. Because if he'd have been Joe Smith, I'd still love him. Who was Alex Cooper? Why do you assume that Alias, and in essence, lived a lie for more than 30 years? And most important, was he still alive? If so, why had he chosen to disappear? For four long years, the Cooper family lived in a constant state of uncertainty. Then on May 27, 1991, the mystery of Alex Cooper finally began to unravel. Halfway across the country in Toronto, another man was reported missing. He was also a traveling salesman. His name was David Cooper, and he bore an uncanny resemblance to Alex Cooper. And you like saving money? Everybody likes saving money. You certainly sound like a sensible person. I'm the sure man you... known as David Cooper had lived in a boarding house in Toronto for nearly a year. Every week, he would venture out to a new community, selling meat products to families via the telephone. <laughs> yeah, that's right, half a cow. We take the shell off it, though. All you get is During one of Cooper's business trips, Sorry, a friend reported him as missing. Police searched Cooper's room and found this photograph. David Cooper and Alex Cooper were one and the same. Sitting there holding this Polaroid of him, I couldn't believe every prayer that I'd ever made and, you know, my dreams were answered because he was alive, but I didn't have him. He was there, but he wasn't there. I had my... Uh... 39th wedding anniversary not too long ago by myself. Please me. Kind of in limbo. On the 29th of May, when Mr. Cooper returned home, he went up to his room. And when he went in to his room or his flat, he noticed that there was uh, evidence of police presence, the dust that's used to take fingerprints was uh, on the wall and it was on a couple of other places. This is Chase. This is Chase. What happened to my room? Mr. Cooper. And at that time, his landlady advised him that he'd been reported missing by the police and the police were trying to find out where he was. Well, who reported me missing? I have no idea, but I know I didn't. I did all right, didn't I? It's not your fault, Mrs. Chase. By the time police returned to the boarding house, Alex Cooper had disappeared once again for reasons known only to himself. We have a person who has something to hide to a point where he would uh, walk away and leave the family that he's been with for the last 35 years. So it has to be something that's... Uh, very serious, or at least he believes it's very serious. I'd love to get him back. I want to give him a real big hug, and then I kind of want to give him a kick in the butt, and then another big hug. But I'd love to have him back. If he's running, I don't know why he's running, but it's time he quit, you know? He's got this family that care about him, and if he's out there living among strangers, he should rethink this thing. We deserve it, and so does he.
Shortly after this story aired, a viewer in Hamilton, Canada, recognized Alex Cooper and immediately called authorities. During questioning, the mystery surrounding his life began to unravel. Alex Cooper told police that his true name was Alban Arsenault. In 1948, he was accused of robbing an office of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, where he was employed at the time. I was young, and I panicked. And I said to myself, there is no way I'm going to be take the fall for this because I didn't do it. I took off at that time, and I became Alexander Cooper at that point. Four years later, Alex married Margaret. He had no idea that any criminal charges that might have been filed against him had probably been dropped. For more than 35 years, his true identity remained a secret. Then, as his 65th birthday neared, Alex Cooper's past began to catch up. I was due for pension, and you require to submit a birth certificate. I knew I couldn't produce one. For several months prior to this, I knew this was coming up. I couldn't bring myself about to tell my family, and so I walked away. It was a snap decision, and it was a wrong one. Two days after he was questioned by Hamilton authorities, Alex Cooper returned to British Columbia and was reunited with his family after more than five years. We're a very close family, and this has been very devastating for all of us, including Alex. And uh, I'm really hoping that we can work through this and uh, put it back together, if not the way it is, maybe something better. We can't pick up where we left off because things have changed. But we're going to start fresh, take it a day at a time. The way I feel, I don't deserve for anybody to accept my apology. That what I'd done, abandonment of your family to me is one hell of a crime. And the biggest job for me at this point will be to make amends, and I would say it'll probably take me the rest of my life. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, this is a legendary Shroud of Turin. Believers say it is the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ and that his image has been miraculously imprinted upon it. Skeptics claim the image was somehow etched on the cloth in the 14th century by a master painter. What is the truth behind the mysterious Shroud of Turin? In 1989, Ethel Kidd began building her dream home in rural Virginia, seeking the safety and security of country living. But in a fatal twist of fate, Ethel soon fell prey to the same kind of senseless crime she had been trying to escape. Joe Maloney was a master of deception and a master of manipulation. He fashioned a devious plot against his estranged wife in which the murder weapon was a party drink laced with poison. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs>